always wait for the special sting. Uh, welcome along, guys. Welcome to the uh, studio stage in partnership with Grabio. Welcome to our second live podcast recording of the day. Uh, a very special one, this one. Uh, we've got Sue Anstis with us, the host, founder, owner uh, of the Game Changers a podcast, CEO of Fearless Women. Delighted to have Sue with us. And I'm going to hand over, without further ado, uh, to Sue to explain what's going on. So yeah. over to you, Sue. Thank you. It's a little bit different today for me. I feel a bit nervous being on the other side. Uh, so I think many of you will know the Game Changers podcast. So we've uh, just been through series uh, eight of the podcast. And we're sort of turning the tables a little bit today to celebrate... Um, uh, the launch of Game On. Thank you, Kate. She's brought a few in at the back of the room there. <laughs> to celebrate the launch of the book. And I am co kind of conscious that we had hoped uh, that Hugo Monnier would be here uh, as my questioner and to turn the tables. And unfortunately, as many of you will realise, he's a little tied up at the moment in terms of uh, his Strictly Week, and I need him to get through to next week. It's important. It's a couple's choice this week, so it's important that uh, he gets through. So Hannah Wilkes from um, Sky Sports has very kindly stepped into the breach for me there to, uh, to host and to ask the questions. So um, going to over to Hannah, really. I think it's yeah down to you. So okay. welcome. Well, thanks, and thanks for letting me step into Ugo's shoes. I can't quite feel them, but I'll do my best. Um, so, Sue, let's dive straight in. You are a founding trustee of the Women's Sport Trust, co-founder of the Women's Sport Collective, podcast host, published author now as well. It all comes down to sport. It's all to do with sport and women's sport for you. So I want to know, was sport part of your life growing up? Uh, yeah, you probably might not be surprised to know it very much was part of my life growing up. So uh, quite a sporty family. Uh, my dad was a PT instructor in the Metropolitan Police. Uh, and my mum was really sporty. It's interesting that I, it's only really recently, I read um, Billie Jean King's autobiography actually in the last couple of weeks, All In, which is fantastic recommendation if you haven't read it yet but she talked about her mother and I hadn't when I people ask me about my family I often talk about my dad and I haven't really talked about my mum but actually she was 5'10 she was she used to swim she ran I went to the same school as her and I my name was on the school cup after hers but actually growing up she played a bit of tennis she was quite active but she never really did much sport and I think she was obviously in that era being born in the 1930s when she did what was seen as, as feminine but I think goodness me she could have been the most extraordinary athlete and that she had high and clearly passion for sport too so I didn't quite answer the, I've, I've gone off the track already on the first question haven't I so yes a very sporty family three brothers and we all kind of played sport and followed sport and I think for me um, it was just normalized that sport was within our family so quite a key part of family life yes grandstand on the television every opportunity at every meal time so yeah so what sports did you try and, and which ones did you fall in love with and which did you think this isn't for me yeah I, I swam I said quite late to swimming um, but I love swimming and that's probably where I progressed the furthest to um, national championships and so on as a youngster 11 12 and then I moved on to track and field so my older brother was an amazing uh, he was an international decathlete and and um, pole bolter actually so I joined the athletics club to be with him uh, and so I did a bit of track and field so running at 800 until I realized I was uh, not quite the right build for 800 so then four and four hurdles um, and then and then like any I guess young woman at that time I played netball I played lots of sports in school um, and yeah which when I went to Loughborough that's when I kind of moved on I discovered volleyball sort of getting there and realizing you needed to be of a really high level of, of sport to play in the netball team so I kind of took up something completely new um, but yeah so sort of swimming and and, tra and track and field really were my sports. I had the same realization when I got to Loughborough oh. no way I was going anywhere that near that team <laughs> um, so how important do you think it was and we're talking to athletes as well we know that a sport family and a supportive family mm. is so key how important do you think it was to ignite that passion for sport in the family setup yeah I, I do wonder if they hadn't been would I have just been a sporty girl anyway and I think uh, I wasn't typical at school of you know it's an all-girls school and I and that they weren't other girls that were as sporty as me but there were sports but there weren't girls coming in with wet hair in the morning from early morning swimming or that activity uh, so I, I just think it was very normal in our family and I look at my I've got three not teenage but older than teenage now um, daughters and I look at 
our family, and we're not very musical, and we're not really into dance, and whatever. And we, I love watching sports that we can. We went to watch the elders play rugby um, out in Reading, and actually that's a joy for us to go and watch her play rugby. Whereas if I was going to watch uh, maybe arts or dance or something else, it wouldn't have had the same appeal. So I think the family life, and I think that's what you, you probably see, isn't it? We just normalised uh, being sporty, and I don't think I was ever treated. Uh, differently to my brothers in terms of sport. I think it was, we just all played sport. Well, you, you mentioned your brothers. You're a twin, actually. Your yeah. twin is, is male. You didn't see then any difference in sort of how you were treated at home in terms of sport. But what about when you were at school or at sports clubs? Did you see any difference based on gender? Yeah, I don't think, I don't think so, actually. I'm not, you look back and I kind of look for it to think, was there any kind of bias or bias in direction? I don't, I don't think... Uh, there, there was particularly, and I'm sure uh, underlying there may have been, but I don't feel that there was. I think we, we played sports quite equally, we were treated quite equally. Yeah, That's good. always good to hear. Yeah. Did you see a relationship change with sport as you grew up? Because we hear so much now about that ever lower age where girls in particular drop off and stop participating in sport. Did yours change as you went through your teens and your 20s? I think it did. It's interesting, I talked to Holly Bradshaw recently for a piece, a uh, lovely interview uh, that we did in the Telegraph, you, you might have seen, but around women's kit and clothing and women's body and body image. And actually, as I talked to her, it's a bit of a confessional, but as I talked to her, I remembered a point at which I was doing athletics and being in the car on the way home uh, with an athletics coach and his daughter and him saying to me, well, you're clearly never going to be a middle distance runner, are you? You just haven't got the body for it. And I'd hit puberty, so I was only probably 12, 13, and my body shape had changed, and that stayed with me. And you know, he's probably stating a very, it was very, very factual. I wasn't going to be, and I was doing some cross country, and I was never going to be a skinny mini like the little girls that were, were passing me by. But that's kind of stayed with me. That how I judged my size then, and what I was able to do, and I like, moved down to more. And I, and I joke about it now. I'm a power athlete, you know, not a, not built for endurance, etc. So it is interesting how that stays with you through that time. So I think um, probably that individual sport when I was younger, swimming, running, and then netball and just I love team sports so the volleyball that I love and I've almost gone uh, full circle now and I'm back to walking netball so I walking netball a couple of weeks ago oh my god it's amazing it's really tough but that being with a team again and playing and excited to play uh, once a week etc oh yeah so I've, I think the team bit is probably what's changed rather than just purely the individual sport and activity. You did, though, compete to triathlon at a high <laughs> level in your 40s. So when did, when did you yeah, start? Yeah. Why did you start? What suddenly made you go, I'm going to do triathlon now? I think uh, probably always had it in my head. Like I mentioned my elder brother. I think that whole him having had a GB vest and I, I never, it was never as good as him. So I think uh, probably had a little bit in my head of someday I'd like to pull on that. Uh, GB vest so and I thought oh I could do it um, you know age group athletes you can do it in triathlon and, and athletics too um, so yeah I don't really know how I started it's a challenge and I did a sprint triathlon and thought well, actually I did swim and I did run <clears throat> how hard can it be to jump on a bike and clip on and off it's quite hard um, but I, so I think it was almost like putting those three together and and just enjoying it and thinking there was an opportunity but for me I'm, I'm a bit either full-on or not at all, and I think during that period, I just got completely uh, into it, yeah, really loved it. Despite how to clip onto a bike, what did yeah. you learn about yourself when you were competing triathlon? I'm quite competitive. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it is that, that it was that competitive side. Uh, I, did, I did love the triathlon, actually. The age group thing, I think they're um, really supportive, and it may be the same within men's age group triathlon too. I don't know if it is, but that whole other women supporting and bringing on that sort of really, kind of really nice side of it. I did enjoy, I enjoyed the training. I think it's really easy uh, to get overly, not addicted to it, but I think triathlon, unlike many sports, because there's three different components and you could just train for any one of those almost full time, uh, it's really easy to, so I ended up training twice a day, you know, six, seven days a week. <clears throat> it's just really easy to, uh, not to overtrain, but just to completely get absorbed in it. So probably that, in my own nature, I realised that I am, yeah, either completely full on or doing nothing at all. So now it's walking netball? Walking netball and swimming and open water swimming, yeah, yeah. So sport's still very much part of your life, but not as all-consuming as triathlon. Yeah, no, and just much more stuff that's, that's enjoyable. Follow the joy is a bit of a, a statement I like to uh, yeah, bandy around, but just to do the things you enjoy. So even the swimming now, so I do open water swimming, but I don't wear my Garmin or my Polar watch. I just want to go in and enjoy it and just be with other people and enjoy it from that side. And that's quite different, I think, to how I've 
um, enjoyed sport in the past. Yeah, that's so important, isn't it? Just to find something you, you love to do. Let's talk about um, business, because aside from being a very busy athlete, you have you know, built a huge career in sport. When did you start working in sport? So I studied sport, books and games at Loughborough. I did PE in English at Loughborough. And uh, I did, worked for Cadbury's for a couple of years in, uh, in sales, selling chocolate out the back of my car. Um, and, but more because I wanted to get into sports marketing and people said actually that was a good place to go and get experience at a blue chip company. So I started working for Gatorade, the American sports drink, uh, and they were due to launch in the UK. So I did uh, two, three years there, building up all their credibility in terms of uh, reputation with national sports teams, but also lots of professional football clubs um, in, in 92, 93. And they didn't launch in the UK in the end, but that was almost, I realized at the time, I was almost in my dream job at 24. I thought this is, I could do this for the rest of my life, traveling. Uh, you know, traveling the world literally and uh, going to sports events and marketing uh, the product. It was just fantastic. <clears throat> and then it all came to a bit of an end as they didn't launch in the UK. Uh, and so I was made redundant at 26, which at the time was a bit of a, a shock. I think, mm. you don't, and I think now probably there's more redundancy around. I think then in the 90s, it was like, well, that doesn't have no smoke without fire. What's gone on there? That, I had that feeling of you know, it didn't feel right that I would not have a, a job to, to go to. And that's when I then launched my own uh, agency. I thought, just give it a go. It's the worst that could happen. I'll go and get another job if it doesn't work out. Uh, and then, yeah, 26 years later, <laughs> it just grew and progressed in terms of uh, sports PR and then, and then PR. So how did you build that business? You, you take a chance at 26 years old, which is such a brave thing to do. What was that experience like in building that company and becoming a boss overnight yeah yeah it's interesting I, I do think back to the whole early days of in my back bedroom in Heston and thinking it was like that uh when you, I'd been young and you played toy shops and you had your little sweets wearing out here and having my own fax machine and my computer and my roller decks and everything so it did definitely feel a bit like that uh, in this, those early days it was fun and I, and I do remember just always being a uh, booper was one of my first clients actually for a big fitness campaign and I remember coming back from um, meetings with them and staying up till really late at night in order to get the contact reports across to them and I never wanted anyone to say oh she's just that girl that works out of her back bedroom in Heston and I, I so I over serviced and that whole attention to detail and wanting to be as professional as you could be and I think that stayed uh, with us at the agency probably and I probably needed to be, let it go a little bit towards the end um, or I was told to just relax chill a bit but I think that whole needing to get everything right and never wanting to um, be seen to be too casual about things came from the time of working on my own and, and wanting to prove myself there. So yeah, that was a, the early days. So what were the highlights of that 25 year journey and what were the really tough bits? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How long you got? Um, <laughs> so now there are lots of highlights, lots of, and I guess that some of the highlights are almost the lowlights too. So I think the highlights of working with an amazing bunch of people and celebrate, so you know, winning awards and doing great campaigns and, and sharing that celebration with other people is really exciting. But actually, the managing people for me is a really hard part too, and that's a bit I'm really enjoying now. Is not managing a team of people. I don't think I'm a particularly good manager of people. So I think that was the bit that is fantastic and joyful and lovely to share with other people and to learn from other people and to guide them. Uh, but actually, that can also be the. I'm sure anybody here that works with <laughs> with an agency, that, you know, it's just people that can be the challenging bit too. Um, and I think almost looking back on 25 years, as you look at me, rounded up. Actually, some of the campaigns we were involved with, sort of driving change and, and being involved with things at a time when things really were changing. And initially through fitness, we did a lot of work within the fitness sector at that time of growth of David Lloyd and Fitness First and so on. And then into sports and grassroots sports. Uh, and, and as an agency, we very much specialised in grassroots when actually lots of other agencies were after. We didn't really follow the money, so we didn't really work in F1 or, or football and so on. We were doing very much working with national governing bodies and grassroots sport. And that's exciting. When I look back and see the work that we did with the likes of hockey and netball and cricket in terms of driving participation, I'm yeah really proud of that, that side. Well, you've clearly seen a huge change, particularly in women's sport in the past two decades, particularly the last decade. When did driving equality in women's sport become a, a real passion and a real motivator for you? Yeah, 
It's probably, I'd like to think it's longer than this, but it probably, I think it must have always been bubbling around and I know that we kept taking on more female clients and doing more stuff with women's sport and, uh, and that's quite hard to balance when you've got an agency that's uh, men and women and you want to be seen to be working across all sport, but I was finding myself, this is actually just want to work in women's sport really. So I think around the time of the Women's Sport Trust getting started, so 2012, I feel that was, um, I had been doing stuff probably for 10 years before that, but that was kind of the core moment when I thought, oh, no, absolutely, I can see, I can have some impact here and there's so much that needs to be done. Uh, so I kind of feel it was probably around that time in the Women's Sport Trust where I was able to almost vocalise to myself, oh, this is absolutely where I feel uh, passionate. And actually, I look back, I look back at those days I mentioned gate, working at Gatorade or the years historically, I think I never really saw the injustice. And I talk to women now and um, lovely Laura Weston, who's on the Women's Sport Trust board with me she found this letter that she wrote when she was at school about the injustice of coverage in the media of women's sport when she was 11 12 and I think oh, I had no idea I think it was just as it was um, and I just accepted that and at Gatorade we worked on you know uh, Leeds Man United Arsenal not for us at the time uh, sponsorship campaigns and working with men's sport with cricket rugby football we hardly worked with any women's sport but I didn't say I didn't question it at the time it's like well that's just how it was I don't I'm not calling out Gatorade because I've done a huge amount for women's sports since then but I think almost in myself it's like well that's how that's kind of what was just the norm was and so I think um, I would recognize in myself it's taken a while to so I feel not embarrassed to say that but it's almost taken a while to think actually that's not acceptable is it so it's almost the just shifting your viewpoint of things too. You mentioned the the Women's Sport Trust you are one of the founding trustees can you tell us how that all started because there's a great story in your book actually about how the very first board meeting was just round a kitchen yeah. table and now it's it's a really powerful body yeah yeah absolutely uh yeah so it's joe um bostock and tammy parlor that that created it and founded it and i think uh, kate richardson Mort actually was doing like she, work experience or an internship with us at the time. We were doing some stuff through the Lifestyle Advisors at, at British Hockey and she had just come out to see whether she wanted to do PR in the future and, and they approached her actually about being a patron of the Women's Sport Trust and she went to a meeting and I said, oh my God, that looks amazing. Can I come with you and talk? And I was like suddenly really excited to talk to her. So I went to the meeting and met Jo and Tammy and they said, oh, we need you on our board too. So that's kind of how it started. And as you say, it did start with a small passion. And Sue Day from the RFU was a, a fellow uh, sort of, uh, founding trustee with me too. And Kate Hannon that I work with now at the Women's Sport Collective was an early trustee as well too. So um, there's a few of us that have been around from those early days. And then as you say, it's evolved and uh, the makeup of the board has changed and it's been super powerful. Uh, but below the radar, I think that's what I love about the Women's Sport Trust is it's not, um, it does have great profile, but it's, that's not what it's about. It's about the convening the decision makers behind the scenes to drive change perhaps rather than loud uh, public campaigns and consumer facing campaigns it's about really making a difference behind the scenes. What are you most proud of in terms of what the Women's Sport Trust has achieved? Like you say some of it's quite quiet but there must yeah. be some things that you can point to and, and feel really proud of playing a part in. Yeah I, th I think in recent years obviously we had the, game, the Be A Game Changer Awards that were a big success and got people talking and uh, sharing. I think some of the, the recent work so the Ambition Report, the Research with Two Circles, the Unlocked campaign helping female athletes to f kind of find their voices and pairing them up with activators in, in business and, and sport and media. So I think some of the stuff that we're doing now uh, feels like it is really really driving and even the, the research we're doing with Futures so being the, the insight gatherer and then sharing that with other people around women's sport. I think uh, there's a lot that we're doing now that's, that's having a, a big impact. Like, yeah, you say in the book, I do use some examples. I mean, the, the piece, I guess, that I a strong memory of is around um, the grid girls and walk-on girls and the kind of calling that out. And we didn't we really put our head up on the parapet at the time and wrote a statement that said why we felt it was right that uh, sport was changing. And the negativity and vitriol we received online and uh, that's kind of my first experience of, of that, um, calling something out and the media kind of pairing the feminists, Nazi feminists, against the you know beautiful glamour girls. So that, I think that being in the whirlwind of all that, but knowing we'd be doing it for the right reasons and we'd never said anyone couldn't do anything, we just wanted women to be recognised for their sporting prowess and their success rather than being an adornment to men's sport. Um, so things like that, I think, uh, although actually there was such negativity, it's like, well, maybe we'll keep our heads down and just keep <laughs> influencing things beneath it, uh, beneath the waves in future. No, always make noise, always <laughs> make noise. Um, from the outside, particularly with the last 18 months we've had it, it can sometimes feel a bit like women's sport is two steps forward, 
one step back, especially depending on, on what news story you're, yeah, yeah. you're reading that day or what figures you're looking at. Is it more positive from the inside? What's the Women's Sports Trust feeling as to where women's sports Yeah, hugely more positive, hugely more positive. And I just think on, I think the thing for me at the moment, I think we've seen amazing sponsorship with the likes of Barclays and Vitality and others in the past, and then obviously the amazing broadcast deals with uh, Sky and BBC on the likes of the FAWSL, but, but other media too. Uh, I think for now, it's all the, for me, it's those things are coming together at the same time and you know, whether it's the uh, sport for the code, gov code of governance from Sport England, so in terms of equality on boards, I think we're seeing all those different things coming together. And that's a bit, that's why I feel most excited about it now, is um, it's the different components coming together. It's a really interesting, having been downstairs, actually some a gentleman came to talk quite vociferously with me, having listened to the session this morning. Uh, but he was thinking, you know, it's not about pay parity, it's not about any of those things, it's not about visibility, it's about governance. He was really strongly, it's about governance, about getting women at the the table at the senior levels to change those decisions until that's done nothing's going to change the rest is superficial so it's really so I'm constantly learning and listening and you know it's really interesting that it's from all those different areas and I think that's the thing I've realized I talked for a long time about visibility I think it's all about visibility and getting the product the quality product in front of people but actually the more I'm in it I, you realize it's not one thing or another it is all of those things coming together that will make the difference but I feel that that they are now why do you think the time is now? Why do you think it's taken quite a while to get to this point? Yeah, that's a good... If I knew the answer, I don't know. Well, I don't <laughs> What's, think, no. What's the secret? <laughs> uh, I, I think it is... I guess it is that, that cumulative building of things, isn't it? So it is... So although I said it's not just one thing, it is the visibility. So actually, even from the report today, uh, people being able to see women's sport is being reported more on the news. People have been called out for not having equal coverage, whether it's on the app or the BBC roundups or whatever. So I think more women's sport and then people watching more women's sport and the quality coming because... The, sponsors and investors are coming I think that's a piece it is snowballing and I do hope I don't really like the phrase tipping point but you think at some point there will come a time when uh, there's so many sponsors coming in so the fact that we've got Google Mastercard you know but I don't mean and Barclays and Vitality is in an offhand way but we know that they're doing it there and doing amazing things and have done for so long but other new sponsors coming Adidas last night with DAZN coming into women's sports I think the money coming in is is so important and yet you can still have lovely Lizzie Dining winning the Paris Roubaix and only getting 1500 pounds when her male counterpart next day got 30,000 pounds you know euros uh, so, so like 20 times more for him than her and so the things that are so obvious it seems well, that's just ridiculous isn't it how can she have done the same race and actually it's the first time in 125 years women have done that race she doesn't need the same money she needs 10 times the money that he won because we've said women can't do it because they're not strong enough well actually she's proved that they are and you give her a fraction so I, so I guess it's like really positive that these things are moving and, and what is positive though is the media calling that out and that was in the Guardian and the Telegraph and so loads of people have made noise about that and I wonder whether even 10 years ago that wouldn't have been a like we might have celebrated that she took part and she won but we might not have talked about it but I think the fact that so many people are outraged someone messaged me on social media and said I'm I tried to explain equality to my children if I can't explain it to my children yeah why is that that she only got that and they got that um if we can't call it out in that way and that's why I guess the change is coming I think it is that young Gen Z generation Z whatever we want to call them but actually brutally saying, well, that can't be right in terms of equality. So, so more of that, along with business waking up and recognising that actually there's, not even in the next year, but in the next five, ten years, this is an opportunity for investment uh, and growth that perhaps we haven't seen in the past. We should say that Lizzie Dygan's team topped up her winning. They did, race. sorry. They yeah, shouldn't fabulous. have to, should they? No, no, it should be the organisers yeah. and the sponsors to start with. Um, you're quite a busy lady. You sit on a lot of boards, um, Lewis FC hey. and Leisure Focus. You're also a member of the RFU, Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Group. Why is it important to you to volunteer for, for all these roles across a real range of sports. Yeah, my husband keeps saying, is anyone going to pay you to be on the board <laughs> at some point? He says that a lot when I tell him I'm on the board. Um, I guess there's a bit of a giving back. I think I, in all those board roles, I get far more from the board roles than I give. I like to feel that I do give a lot to. Uh, but in terms of what I learn and uh, I guess about volunteering, isn't it? You feel good in, in the giving. But I learn and I'm exposed to new people and new ideas and everything. So I think uh, in every board role, 
uh, you'd learn so much more from being there and being involved. So, yeah, I guess I need to. I did let go of a few a couple of years ago. I stood down from a few. Uh, I was I was chair of the uh, Get Back to Active, and I was sat on the Active Partnership National Board. And I stepped back to create some more space, and then. <laughs> filled it up again with other things. So uh, it's hard sometimes not to say yes to fantastic opportunities, but I tried to just go for, I mean, like Lewis is a case in point. I have a very busy schedule, but actually I, I approach uh, Maggie Murphy to ask what I could do and how I could help Lewis, because I feel so aligned to all that they're about. So I guess when the right opportunity comes along, it's hard to turn it down when it feels like it's absolutely the right thing to do. There might be people listening, people sat here thinking, you know, I, I have that desire, I want to help, but quite often it's easy to say that we don't have the time yeah, what would yeah. you say in terms of encouraging people to to make the time and take the chance yeah i think you do find the time don't you just i do i do believe in and I, again i it's like hearing other things over years of needing to make space so having if you're going to add more things on you've got to decide what it is you're going to give up if you're a busy person so i do think there is an element of what you're going to let go you can't just keep adding more and more to it which I do feel like I might be doing. But uh, so, yeah, finding that space to do. But I think sometimes it's just the, um, and this is a bit of what we do with the Women's Sport Collective, is just encouraging women to take that first step. And, you know, I think my first board role was with um, BASES, the British Association for Sport and Exercise Science. And I'm not really an exercise scientist, you know, that's 30 years ago, but that wasn't really why I did that degree. Um, but I went onto their board to help them commercialise their membership and so on. <coughs> Uh, but for me, it was, a, it was a gentle start to being on a board that then took the next step to UK Active and I moved on to other boards too. So I think, uh, yeah, just putting your hand up and getting involved in some way is a good place to start. Well, on the, the Women's Sport Collective and Fearless Women that you are CEO of as well, for those who don't know, can you tell us about the collective, what it is and why you set it up? Yes, yeah, so the um, Women's Sport Collective, uh, co-founded with Kate Hannon, is that over there, uh, in... I need her here to remind me of when it was. Uh, but so, yeah, September, a year ago, just over a year ago. Um, and it was really created, I guess, out of the, the... We had done some stuff in the past at Promote, just getting together amazing females that we'd meet working in sport. And I, because we were very lucky as an agency to work across different sports, I would sometimes meet someone amazing who was like the commercial director of rowing or CEO of netball or something. And they wouldn't necessarily know the other women uh, across sport in the way that we did. So we did lots of introductions. And then we did a couple of lunches of just bringing them together just to talk and, and to build their networks too. Uh, so we had done that in the past and then it f just felt right at the time of uh, lockdown. I emailed about 70 women and just said, shall we just create something online a very, in a more casual way just to have a bit of an online network? And obviously it was very timely because no one had anything else to do or no one else to go at that time. Um, so we did a pilot during the summer of 2020. 2020, I've lost a year almost. And then we launched it at the end of September. Uh, and yeah, so it's been a year of, and we're now at 3,200, just over 3,200 members from across the world, about 60 countries, all different levels of sport, uh, just bringing together women working in sport with a chance to learn and share and, and flourish. And we do monthly webinars. So we have amazing guests that come and talk and share, whether it's personal development, professional development topics. We have monthly networking sessions. We've had a book club, all kinds of stuff. And we're just beginning to meet in person now, which is really exciting. So, unsurprisingly, we're off to Lewis FC on Sunday uh, to watch a game there and we're going to watch the Red Roses play in Northampton in November and we were talking um, to England Network yesterday about going to watch the Roses play maybe at the Copper Box or um, up in Leeds. So, yeah, exciting to now be getting women together in place. And actually, even here at Leaders, it's been amazing both to meet women for the first time that we've been with, has been within the collective, but I had some really fantastic conversations with women who, have, who lost their jobs or were not in a good place and then came across the collective during lockdown. Um, and it's really transformed how they feel about the sector. And that's, so that's quite, anyway, quite emotional. It's quite empowering. We, I guess we do research and we hear that we know it's succeeding because it's growing and uh, we have that feedback. But actually when you meet people and they even you know in their ones and twos and they tell you what an impact it's had, we're going to get little pin badges for future conferences so we'll know who's in the collective. Um, but actually that has been really powerful from that side. So yeah, it's been great to see it grow. And, and uh, we set it up completely pro bono and just spent our time on it because as I say, we, we weren't busy doing other things. Um, and then as it grew and it took more time and then there were costs incurred just in terms of your, your Zooms and 
MailChimps. Uh, we went out to a few partners just to say, could someone just cover our costs? So it's not for profit, but we just like to cover our costs. And wonderful Sky Sports uh, stepped forward, the first to come forward and say, absolutely, really happy to be involved. So that's been great for us, not just the funding, which helps just cover our time, um, but also in terms of the profile and reaching out and, and working with them too. So that's been really, yeah, really pleased. And I can say from first-hand experience that those online networking events are great and you meet people from all different backgrounds, all different levels of their career and everyone gets so much out of it. What are the, the themes that you get from the women in those sessions as to the challenges they face and what they need change to see in the industry? Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I never want to talk. It's almost that whole thing about female coaching, isn't it? We want to get more skilled women and more confidence and whatever. And it's like, you don't want to change your women. You want to change the system. And I do feel that across sport and, uh, you know, generally in work, we want to change the system that makes it easier for women to progress. Uh, but I think sometimes we do talk a lot about confidence, about uh, that needing more confidence. And actually, when we have researched uh, the women within the collective, confidence is a huge issue that comes up, that kind of imposter syndrome uh, and having more confidence. So I think uh, definitely that's something that is flagged. I think people want um, to build their network and their connections in a way that perhaps men have and women haven't had in the past. Uh, and I think, yeah, so kind of overcoming that imposter syndrome and learning about the sector. We do have women wanting to come along and learn more about the industry and the sector too. So definitely that, that's kind of, a, I guess, a third piece. And being part of something bigger than themselves, it, you know, and, and whether that's um, bringing through the next generation. And we hear a lot of that with female athletes, don't we, with England, the hockey players and so on, want to inspire the next generation. And lots of the women, right from the very first pilot, want to see more women working in the sector and therefore want to showcase the amazing roles. And I've had conversations today about insight managers and data and where, where are the women, why, why are women not coming through into those roles? So women that are working within the sector and love the sector want to do more to showcase the roles that are available. So we're definitely, Kate and I've got so many plans for the future of what we could do. We haven't got enough hours in the day, have we? Uh, but I think that's definitely something is what more with the women working in the sector now can do to help showcase what's available to other women for the future. Can you give us a hint as to what those plans might be between these two great minds? Oh. Kate's eyes have just gone very big, yeah. which means uh, something exciting. Yeah, no, lo yeah, watch this space. Lots of exciting things. Okay. Really. <laughs> I'll keep a firm eye on it. Now, look, we're here recording an episode of the award-winning Game Changers podcast. Why did you start the podcast amongst all your other things and what were you looking to achieve through it? Yeah, I did, why did I? Uh, it was that promote that I started the podcast actually and uh, I think it was a, a probably similar to uh, the, the Women's Sport Collective too but that wanting to celebrate the trailblazing women that were out there making a difference and I think we've been it's been amazing to have fantastic athletes a, as guests but actually some of the women behind the scenes I think I wanted to share their stories and to learn as well. I think anyone that has the podcast knows. It's just amazing. What a privilege to go and talk to those women and, and find out more too. So it's probably almost like a, I've created a podcast that I would like, that I thought wasn't there, that I would like to have listened to uh, and to find out more, say, about their stories and, and what they'd overcome and how that could then help other women in the future too. You've interviewed over 70 guests in the past two years, which yeah. is a lot, a huge amount. If someone is, is just finding the podcast for the first time, should they go back to the very beginning? Is there a midpoint? Is the one, is the one particular <laughs> chat that you think you know, encapsulates everything it's yeah, about? Yeah, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard, it's hard to know. And we do see, we track the metrics and see. And actually, Kate Richardson Walsh's, which was in the very, actually, she, hers was the very first one I did record, and it's in the first series, um, is still the most popular of all of them across the, the two years. Um, so not to say to start with that, but she was very natural and relaxed and all those things too. So I think there's the, almost like the athletes and they've been really lucky to talk to Jess Ennis Hill and Denise Lewis and Sarah Story and others, as I say, but there, there are some, it's almost those sometimes women I didn't even know before I spoke to them, someone like Moya Dodd, uh, who was the first woman on the FIFA council, Rose Riley is like an amazing, you know, just a really funny, amazing story of her incredible uh, career playing football for Scotland and playing in Italy. Um, so, yeah, I'm not really giving you an answer, am I, really? Dip in, <laughs> dip in and listen to them all. But I think uh, it's interesting, actually, us looking back across that whole catalogue, we're thinking now of how do, how do we better categorise and gather that content? Because there is so much fantastic content, and it can be a bit daunting to go... <laughs> Goodness me, there's you know, 70 of them. And we've done five series with Barclays, so Fearless Women in Football, where we've, we've also talked to women whose careers touch football or broadcasters um, and coaches and so on too. So uh, 
Oh, yeah, I'm not really answering your question at all. Listen to them all. No, I think they're all good. They are all they're good. All they're good. all good in different ways. Yeah. Um, and I believe you have some exciting plans I for the Game Changers that you can announce today. Today, today. To these people here, yeah, we're really super excited. So I haven't written the press release yet to say it, but confirmed <laughs> yesterday uh, that Sport England are going to sponsor and support the next three series of the Game Changers to work with us as a partner. So, yeah, it's really big news. Yeah, we're very. Whew, Really, you know, delighted. And actually, what's lovely with them is that um, they really want, they sponsored one series uh, about four or five ago, but they really want to collaborate with us and work with us and, and um, to look more in terms of uh, definitely a focus on female coaching, which we're really interested in too, to bring that to life more. Uh, and just, yeah, to work with them and then to take that content, as we said, almost that, all that content that sits there, so historical content and then these series moving forward and to do more webinars and to package it more in terms of education. So all the things we've said actually around the collective about showcasing these amazing roles, letting women see, you know, younger women see what Emma Hayes is doing and what these jobs entail as a broadcaster or administrator and coach or a CEO of UK Sport uh, to begin to bring that to life too. So yeah, really, really excited uh, about that moving forward. Oh, Brilliant. Congratulations, that is great Thank news. Um, Shall we talk about the book? Yes, go on then. Um, it's, it's great. Game on, the unstoppable rise of, of women's sport. It's um, a manifesto, you call it, and a sort of plan for the future. And it was just long listed for the William Hill Sports Book of the Year just last week. So it's safe to say it's going down very well since Thank it was you. released a month ago. How delighted have you been with the reception it's had so far? Yeah, really, really, really pleased, actually. Yes. Yeah, so, uh was I, am I more surprised? I think I am much more surprised. Uh, yeah, no, really, it's been really positive and uh, yeah, it's just lovely. And again, being here, it's lovely hearing from people and people talking to you. It's that kind of nervousness when you write it and it's your baby uh, for a year of kind of editing and, and shaping it and then getting it out there and people reading it. And that is, uh, yeah, it was a bit of a, a scary moment. But yeah, it's been really, really positive. I guess one of the most positive things for me is, and I, and I even, um, we're signing books downstairs now, people all taking the book and saying, you know, this is for my daughter or for my niece or my PE teacher. But actually it's the men that are reading it that's having the biggest impact. And so some of the emails I'm getting from men who are saying really honestly, Oh, it's just ch completely changed the way, the lens through which I look at sport and I'd never thought about that. And even my, my husband didn't read any of it when I was writing it, didn't want to read it. And he didn't even read it when it was in the draft format. He wouldn't read it until it was a book. He's mentioned in it, but he was okay about it. I didn't chat with him too. But he read it as a book, and he was, you know, he's got three daughters. He's been very much involved in my life and seen. But he came back and said, I had no idea about this, or, you know, opening his mind to things. So I think uh, I do talk about it as a bit of a manifesto and a rallying cry. But I think it's as much about changing hearts and minds. And I, and I, one, I worry sometimes, sadly, but about the title of, of women, The Unstoppable Rise of Women's Sport. It is what it is. But does it almost need a different wrap, a different cover to get men to take it and read it? Because is actually that's it's them changing their mindset that might then bring the biggest change that we see moving forward. I think we just have to make sure we're buying copies for yes, all the men in our absolutely. life for Christmas that's absolutely. coming up and there's some really interesting information there that even someone who works in women's sport and, and thinks I know a lot about it yeah, there's some yeah. information there that I had no idea about and it is really eye-opening I mean what motivated you to write it because you say right at the very start that the inequality of women's sport makes you angry so there's obviously that anger as, as a motivator but why did you decide to sit down and write 300 pages yes. on women's sport i think i had always wanted to write a book i think uh, it's probably that studying english isn't it and i think i like many people you feel that there's a book inside you i think i thought i thought it was a fiction book i thought i would write a story a novel and maybe i still will do one day so i think a novel is probably where i thought i would write um so i think that kind of came together with all the great content from the Game Changers. And my initial thought was that I would take the Game Changers content of all those interviews, which are just fabulous. And, you know, each of them gets, uh, you know, three, 4,000 downloads, but, but it could go to so many more people, the content. So my initial thought was I would take that content and craft that into a book around the Game Changers. And actually um, spoke to an agent who said, actually, follow your journey, go and discover something, go and learn. You know, so he helped me shape 
what do they call it, editorial spine or something of that kind <laughs> of the book. Um, and that, that was such sound advice. And that's how I, so I was then able almost to write it, but learn in the process too. And although it had a lot of what I did already know, it's, it's been amazing to go, like the history, the science behind women's bodies, the, you know, so much of it that I didn't know about. So I really have enjoyed the process of coming to it and not thinking I needed to know it all in order to write it. So if anybody else is thinking of writing a book, um, that's definitely advice I would give. It's almost pick a topic that fascinates and interests you, but use it as a process to go and go and learn more. Yeah, my mind was open to just how much of a difference the right sports bra can make. Oh when my it comes god, to that was running. a bit. My husband, that was a yeah. bit. My husband said, I had no idea. And neither did I. I know. <laughs> um, did you have anyone in mind when when you wrote it? Obviously, you know, you've just mentioned that actually you kind of want a lot of men to read it. Yeah, but was yeah. there any sort of target audience you were really thinking? No, about? I think it probably was for the sports or for for those working within women's sport. I feel probably in my head I had that and it's been interesting that some of the feedback from um, some the publishers send it out to various bloggers they go you to go on a book blog tour it's all new to me and um, bloggers who have no interest in sport at all read it so I guess I hoped that people like that might be interested but actually it's probably a bit too much technical detail and I think you have to have some element of interest in sport uh, to really get behind it and enjoy it so I think probably a sporting audience and I do I've heard someone else say this now so I've just stolen this quote but I do think it's almost like I wrote it for myself 10, 15 years ago. It's definitely, I didn't have me in mind at all when I wrote it, but I just use that now because it sounds good historically. <laughs> um, but I think when I, when I think about what's in it, I would love, at that time of the Women's Sport Trust, if I could have picked up a book like that, or when I was working first at Gay Trade and, and, and seen the history and, and given myself, I guess it says arguments, isn't it? That's the thing I hope, it, it's almost like a guidebook. But when someone says, why do women only pay three sets and not five like men? Or, you know, they don't deserve the funding because they're not bringing in the crowds. So all that same old, same old. I hope that the book, and I know it is because women and men are telling me it does, it gives them the confidence and the answers almost to, to call that out and in a rational way, but at least to have the answers as to why it is where it is and why history has got us into this place and what we all need to do to change it moving forward. So I hope that, I hoped it would be that and I think uh, it definitely is. So probably it's written more for, a, for anyone with an interest in sport and people keep buying it for PE teachers and those enthusiastic about sport. So it does feel like it's it's probably that audience. You've got the answers for any troll on Twitter when it comes yeah, to yeah. sports now. I just get the book out and give them, what they, <laughs> give them what they need to do. Was it hard to write? Because some of it as well is, is very information heavy and yes. there's a lot of historical context in there there's facts and figures was, was some of it harder to write than others yeah I think uh, I guess some of it was completely new to me so the history part was I learned so much so there it was learning other parts it was almost reporting the bits that I already knew uh, the the chapters towards the end so the piece on sport for the sport for development and the international that was fascinating so I didn't really know much about that at all so that was um, a lot of learning there so some bits were were harder than others but I think generally I was fat it was all areas that I was fascinated in, like adding more chapters. So it was meant to be uh, 70,000 words, I think it's 86,000 in the end, because I kept saying, oh, wait, could I do a chapter on this? And grassroots participation and femininity and LGBTQ and race and women's sports. So it did, it grew as I kind of went through and added more and more. You also added quite a lot of personal stuff in there as well, didn't you? Talk quite openly about, yeah. about yourself and you know, competing in triathlon and struggling with menstrual cycles. Was that difficult or was that something you felt quite important to do to put a piece of yourself in there? Yeah, I think it was important to be honest. That's, that's some of the people I've had from a lovely old friend said, oh, it's, it's very personal. You know, he was a little bit uncomfortable with it. But actually, if we're going to be authentic and real and talk about changing those things, I think I need to be the first to step up and, and to do that too. So yeah, I think for me, you know, it's not memoir but it but it is important that I talked about my journey and how that related to sport I think that that's um, an important part it could have just been a book full of facts and figures but I think the fact that it sits alongside my own journey and my professional journey as well as my journey and being a mother and also as an athlete too so yeah I was really happy but it's funny is there are there are a couple of bits that when people say they've read the book I think oh have you got how far have you got have you got to that but yeah there were some some personal bits that in that too and yeah. it was crowdfunded as well yes, what difference yeah. did that make to the publication process and the writing process yeah well my goodness the publication process itself is so the whole world of publishing is something new to behold uh, and so slow and archaic, I have discovered. Uh, so actually, the crowdfunding was was, mu was a much quicker 
away. I was, I was on the traditional route and I was speaking to an agent and we were talking to publishers and it just felt like it was going to take forever. Um, and then it's actually uh, Kath Spencer's book, Mud and Mascara. I went to the, I've only been to two book launches, hers and, and then mine. But I went <laughs> to her book launch and met her Unbound, the publisher, and thought, oh, actually, that's fantastic. I could do it much more quickly, get it out there, shape it more. Um, and so we kind of went that route. And what it did mean is that uh, it was quite long. So people were, people were pledging for the book, which is fantastic. And then saying, oh, when's it coming? It's like, yeah, I've got to write it. Yeah, I haven't written it yet. <laughs> so I think that, that's a bit of an odd process of getting people to pledge for something. They thought they bought it, or they, and they had bought it, but it hadn't been created yet. Um, so you do that initially first. You get all your crowdfunding done, and then you write your book. Uh, but it did mean they were, people were on that journey. So 660-odd people that pledged were on that journey with me. And then when it came to publication, they got it early, and, they, and you, know, you didn't ask anyone to do this, but people were excited and shared it across social media and talked about it. So they almost become your early ambassadors to share news of the book. So from that side, it's really that's really exciting and really positive. And oh, nice seeing all their names in the back. Oh, I recognise a few colleagues and stuff having yeah. a little skills. Oh, nice it's see you. Lovely. And Vitality, actually, for shout out, so well, Vitality came on board as well towards the end and just helped top up that crowdfunding piece, which then helps get more people on board too. Yeah. So you're clearly still very passionate about driving change in women's sport, in, in everything you do on, on multiple platforms. What is it that keeps your passion ignited? I think, I guess for me, it is about women's sport and I love women's sport, but it is that bigger piece about uh, women and society and what sport means and what sport can do. And I think that's the piece, and I, I do talk about this in the book, but that whole sport being so in part of all of culture whether it's in news bulletins or it's the news, in newspapers or the way we talk about it you know the, the fact that there's a massive conference here with all these people you know it's just so much part of society and I think uh, just sports power to reflect and magnify what's happening in society but also to drive change in society so that's a piece for me and we, we go back to the whole Paris-Roubaix this weekend in terms of uh, uh, what Lizzie did and the, and the inequality in funding but having that conversation does that then trickle out to someone thinking yeah well this isn't right for the job that I do here or this isn't right for how my daughter's being treated or how I'm being treated so I think for me it's the power of sport and that profile of amazing athletes uh, to change equality in society and also all the pieces around women's bodies you know not just women because they need to be feminine and beautiful but women that can be strong and fearless and powerful and how it makes women and girls see to see women on stage, you know, front and centre in the way that men are too. So I think that's a bit I probably over time I've got more passionate about as I've seen the impact that sport can have more broadly across society. And I'm sure for this next question, you've got some maybe new thoughts after being here for a couple of days. But right now in 2021, mm. what do you see as the key challenges facing women's sport? Yeah, it's, it's weird, isn't it? So sometimes I think, and we, had a few, we have had a few calls and, and, and uh, conversations, I guess, in the last couple of days. For me, sometimes it feels so bloody obvious. It's like, oh my God, there's this amazing opportunity. You're, the, there's men's sport here, and then there is this huge opportunity in terms of investment and profile and how women's sport is seen driving social change and you know, all those things. And, and I guess what's fantastic is we're seeing more research that's highlighting that and sharing that now. So for me, it, not if it was really obvious, but I just feel like it's a missing part that people aren't seeing where the opportunity lies. So I think more uh, fantastic open-minded brands, so the likes we mentioned, Google and MasterCard and others, but bigger brands coming in and putting proper money behind women's sport. And then, you know, I'm not calling out because you're on stage, but, but Sky Sports and BBC and others and the free-to-air coverage, so getting it in front of uh, people, I think that will make the difference too. Um, yeah, so I think it's those many components. And as I've said that call it conversation earlier, uh, but in terms of governance and changing the structure of sport too. So it is many of those things, but I think, I think for me, it's about profile and visibility and people being exposed to it. I'm a massive fan of women's rugby and that's changed over the years. But how hard have I had to work on a Saturday, whatever, to watch the Allianz Premier 15 on streaming it and it's two cameras from Loughborough and the wind's blowing and I can't quite hear, you know. It's, and I, you know, I work really hard to see it and then we'll watch, you know, um, whatever, Harlequin's men on the Friday night. And it's just the most amazing commentary and camera and whatever. So I think that's the piece for me is the quality. I've said, you asked me one thing and I'm going to give you five. No, this is great. <laughs> uh, but it's the, that quality of actually taking those fans and, but giving them a product uh, that lets them see the sport as it, as it really should be seen. Yeah, not having to work quite so hard to yeah, access exactly. it. A bit more accessibility. What drives you then moving forwards? 
Uh, yeah, probably more of the same, really. I, th I, I do love that we're, uh, that we're seeing change, and I think that's exciting. Probably if I was doing what I was doing and we were still where we were 10 years ago, I might I want to start off on a different path, exploring something <laughs> different. But I think it's really exciting to be part of something and seeing that change and seeing, and again, uh, you know, that we talk a lot about the importance of male allies coming on board. So I think seeing more uh, men, and it's great to see, you know, as many men as women in the room here today. So I think that whole seeing men getting it and coming on board and supporting is exciting but also it's, you know we had a, a women in sport breakfast this morning um, it's just amazing the energy and the power and whatever in the room to go and drive change but that's the bit that excite you couldn't be there and not be excited about the momentum that's coming and, and what we can do for women's sport and, and women across society well Sue it's been a joy turning the tables Thank and you. interviewing <laughs> you today I don't know how you found oh, the experience was on okay. the other side of it yeah not too bad not too bad thanks so much thank you thank you very much indeed thank you to everybody for being here